As we've all heard today, we know that the economic success for a family is education. And a key to that is ensuring that young adults have opportunities beyond high school graduation. I am really excited about the panel we have here today with us to talk about the important role of college savings and asset development paired with mentoring and financial literacy. They're all going to talk about the work that they're doing from their unique perspectives. We have Lee Tivill, who is CFEG's Director of Savings and Financial Security. Lee has spent her entire career in asset, in asset building fields with more than 15 years of policy and program experience. Cindy Wallace is the Vice Chancellor for Student Development at Appalachian State University. Cindy is an educator who has served Appalachian State for 28 years and has sought to ensure that the undergraduate experience is improved. Jocelyn Stewart directs community relations efforts for Barclay Card US. Since the company's founding in 2000, she has developed community strategy and managed Barclay's volunteer and financial resources to achieve Barclay's community goals. And we have Emily Boak, who is a legislative aide to Senator Marco Rubio. As legislative aide, she is responsible for advising the senator on key policies and legislation concerning education, while also working to promote policy initiatives like the American Dream Accounts Act. Lee, do you want to start us off? Thanks, Melanie. Um, we're delighted to be here. As, as you heard from Andrea, CFED has been part of this field since really it's the, the very beginning of, of the, the child savings field. And we're, we're truly honored to be participating now in some of the, the emerging efforts that are going on across the country. Um, and uh, I've been asked today to uh, kind of offer a little bit of, of a description of the landscape of child and college savings initiatives that are emerging uh, around the nation. You know, this is an idea that was first pioneered, as Andrea said, nearly 10 years ago in our first national demonstration of kids' accounts. And since then, our friends in San Francisco have truly led the way in pioneering this kind of work at much larger scale. And that has sparked significant excitement around the country in this area to the extent that now there are child savings programs in various stages of development underway in, in literally a couple of dozen communities around the country. This is truly an idea that has, as we saw today with Senator Kuntz, has captured the imaginations of leaders at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, before I kind of offer some, some examples of what that's looking like, I want to start by sharing a few general trends that we're seeing in these kinds of initiatives across the country. First, we're seeing that most of the emerging initiatives are not designed as standalone savings programs. Rather, they are being embedded into existing large systems that are already reaching great numbers of kids and families where they are, schools, college readiness programs, early childhood settings, those kinds of places. And each of these is seeking to achieve the universal goal that Jose described in their own way, serving every child in a particular school, in a particular community, even in a particular classroom. The second trend is that, uh, again, sort of following the path of, uh, of San Francisco's leadership, we are seeing public sector involvement present in almost every emerging child savings program, particularly those at meaningful scale. And, and the, the, that presence varies widely. It might be city or county government, a school district, a housing authority, a Head Start program. But in almost every one of these initiatives, there's a public sector role somewhere. And then third, we're seeing a focus not just on kids, but also on their parents, and a heavy emphasis from day one on strategies to keep kids and their families engaged in the programs and generate savings. We have learned that it's not enough just to open an account and hope for the best. We've got to ensure that we're touching kids and families at various points along the way and supporting and encouraging them to save, and that includes providing the financial education that they need to make the most of the opportunity. So I'm very briefly going to share a couple of examples of initiatives that are emerging at the federal, state, and local levels here. I want to just offer the caveat that these are good examples, but they are by no means a comprehensive list of everything that's out there. So just a quick sampling. Federally, of course, the exciting legislation like the American Dream accounts that you've heard about today. Again, we're just delighted about this. But we're also seeing um, agency level interest in the federal government. A, a notable example is through the Department of Education and their Gear Up initiative gaining early awareness and readiness for undergraduate preparation. This is their college readiness program for seventh graders and on up. Uh, the department is looking to embed savings and financial education into gear up programming in a number of exciting ways. At the state level, 
In Colorado, the head of the state's Department of Human Services is working with CFED and the Aspen Institute's uh, Ascend program to design a two-generation child savings program that could serve as many as 10,000 kids a year in the family's child care program for working families. This is still in development, but what's really exciting is that it's coming through the state agency. It's the first time we've seen it at this, this kind of thing at that scale. And also this two-generation approach that is also going to offer asset building tools and services to the parents as well as the kids. In other parts of the country, there are 15 states currently that incentivize deposits into 529 college savings accounts for low-income families. Uh, and, and there are some states that are even going above and beyond. In the last uh, month or so, the Nevada State Treasurer announced plans to open a college account for every kindergartner in 13 of the rural counties in that state. And then locally, we're seeing a lot of other innovation, again, sparked in large part by our friends in San Francisco. Cuyahoga County at Cleveland uh, was inspired to develop universal accounts for all kindergartners, and they've recently passed legislation to do that. It's going to reach about 14,000 kids a year in public, private, charter, and parochial schools. In Jackson, Mississippi, the mayor has been a champion for the last several years. We've embedded, we worked with the city there to embed children's accounts into the city's uh, municipally run early childhood programs. Great story about this recently on the PBS Need to Know program. And in the Puget Sound in Washington State, the Seattle, King County, and Tacoma uh, public housing authorities are in the design process for a pilot. So we're really seeing a tremendous diversity of stakeholders that are coming to the table and saying this is something we think is an important missing piece of the puzzle for our communities. Again, I'm barely scratching the surface of what's happening across the country, but uh, this is a, a sort of a first taste for you of the growing momentum in the field nationally. So I get to be the educator up here um, and have been doing this for a while and, and I can't tell you how exciting it is to have these financial partners in the room because we desperately need you. Uh, if there has been one story that's resonated across the United States in the last few years, it has certainly been that college debt, and Jamira just shared her personal story of that, has been um, a problem that is, that is more and more evident as tuition and fees um, rise in states and I might add, the primary reason that they are rising is because state appropriations are dropping. I am from a public school in the beautiful mountains of North Carolina, part of the UNC system. And we have had a great tradition in North Carolina of supporting higher education at a very high level. Um, our, my friends from California are one of the other states for whom affordability, uh, we generally rank fairly high. But these last four or five years have brought economic challenges that few states have been able to cope with, not to mention our municipalities and others that we have, are sharing the, the conversation with today. But at Appalachian State, we have a long, rich history of serving an underserved region. We are in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. And part of our legacy has been that of educating first-generation low-income individuals. While our history has changed um, a great deal over the last 100 years, the growth of that group of students, that is the demographic that is facing us in waves coming into college. Um, they are our first generation students. And I think the question that has been placed here today is how do we respond to that? And one of the things my university decided to do was to make as one of its signature programs an access program. And it is our commitment to college education and student success. And it is a debt free commitment. And what we are doing is leveraging all of the kinds of uh, possible support um, represented by people here with me today and discussed here in this, in this room. And for many of you I know that are in the audience have been very much a part of these discussions. Federal aid is absolutely our foundation. The Pell Grant is the defining um, federal program of the greatest financial need. For our access program, it's an estimated family contribution of zero, which means that family of four is earning approximately $23,000. Now, you tell me how you eat every month, much less um, save and support a child going to college. But with our students that we bring in every year, this is our commitment to them. And we look at building that financial aid package from Pell eligibility to our state need-based aid, any discretion, the third category that the university has in discretionary funds, and that differs widely from university to university and state to state, 
And that fourth category are these amazing areas of public support. Where do we raise private dollars? And that has been a commitment of, of our university in a comprehensive campaign. So we combine those very important investments. We build that package for that student, and it differs for every single student. And many of you in this room may have helped finance your own college education by doing that. A higher percentage of these students work than national average. 82% of our access scholars work. Our retention rates, our graduation rates, and their academic success either equals or exceeds that of an average student at Appalachian, even though their academic readiness profile through high school grades, et cetera, may not be as high. And you would ask why is that when their obstacles have been so much greater? It is because of that second piece that we're talking about, about how you build a support program. The dollars are critical. No one can go to college without them, but if we don't match that, with the kind of deep mentoring, the coaching, and the support, we cannot be successful here. And that huge default rate from colleges and that issue that students are dealing with, largely it is because they are not degree completers. That's another part of the data, the, the, the deep analytical approach to doing a program like this that we know. Um, as Lee just said, we stand on the shoulders of our gear up colleagues. We were one of the first gear up grant universities in the United States. We've been part of TRIO education since the 70s and part of our great society that said we must extend the option of higher education to those that have not been afforded that luxury. Because back then it was more like a luxury and as you've discussed today, it's a reality for all of us. Um, you can call it selfish or you can call it altruistic, but unless we meet this need, indeed our, our communities and our nation will suffer. So we build in the deep mentoring and the coaching. We hire grad students to be mentors that meet with each one of our access students every single week. They help pay their way through college, again, extending that circle that does the, uh, so much good. It is wonderful, Jameer will be twice as powerful with a college freshman, um, as perhaps some of us uh, elder individuals or more experienced folk in the room, because of that relational place, I've walked in your shoes. I fought that struggle. I have found a way to be ready for that test. But why do we need so much more support here? And I think it is even with the kind of financial support that we are bringing to bear every year in squeezing every possibility out of federal and state dollars, discretionary funds, and finding amazing private partners every year for whom this is a priority. There are incidental costs along the way that are very hard for these students to find the money for. It is critical that we help them along that path. They don't have a safety net. They cannot email their parents and ask for additional funds. And I think that our data and that deep place that we should all go in terms of accountability, of showing how these, um, these programs work, I think that's that transformative place that's wonderful for me to get to work every day. Um, I will end because we have this little, uh, we've got those little signs up here in the front. But as we, um, Part of the thing that I think we have to pay attention to that is going to be critical with this savings account notion, there are some key federal policies that need to change. And in building a financial aid package for a student, currently you are penalized if there is any money out there in there that has to count towards your family's statement. The FAFSA is a bear. We're trying to help with that process, but summer jobs money that is coming from a wonderful program like the kindergarten to college, we have got to change federal policy so that that individual is not penalized and that money truly can be used to support their education. I'm going to fly home to North Carolina tonight and I will get to watch an Access Scholar named Seth walk across the stage on Saturday. Seth has come from a family that has absolutely no ability to help him. He's made a decision to not heat his house for the last two years, and trust me, I live in a cold climb. Um, the uh, average temperature in the winter is, is in the 20s and the 30s, and we get a lot of snow. So Seth went without heat 
in order to maximize his access dollars. He is going to graduate with a double degree in uh, sustainable development and supply chain, man uh, chain management. He has a fabulous job at 23, having worked every single week of his life to get through college. He will have the first financial security he has ever had. That's not just changing Seth's life, he's changing a generation. And I deeply appreciate the chance from Opportunity Nation, from our wonderful financial colleagues, and encourage all of us to work harder to do more. Thank you. So I'm from Barclays, and we are new kids on the block in this arena. Um, we've actually been talking to Senator Chris Coons for years about this, um, but really weren't in a place where we thought we could actually help the way we wanted to. Um, some things have changed at Barclays, all for the good, especially if you sit in my seat, but we have a new CEO, and he is committed to being a different kind of bank. He has publicly stated our values, which include stewardship and respect and integrity. And this is the perfect project for us to work on. So that being said, the idea is where do you start? I mean, the issues, as you've heard today, start as early as kindergarten and go all the way through getting through college. But we want to maximize our resources and the skills that we can bring. And so we looked at the entire continuum, and it became apparent to us that where we thought we could do the most help is in that later time where kids are in college, but they can't get through college. I have a dear friend who I just found out is Cindy's friend, um, a person named Dr. Uh, Harry Williams, who runs Delaware State University. And the first time I spoke to him, he said, uh, I said, what are your greatest challenges? And he didn't even hesitate. He said, graduation rates. At Delaware State, 35% of the kids that start freshman year will ever graduate. And that, to me, was shocking. Then when we started digging into this issue, again, it became apparent through the Monitor Institute, which um, was mentioned in the film, that if you live in the lowest income quartile, less than $36,000 a year, 70% of those kids will graduate from high school, 60 will start college, but only 8% will ever graduate. And even if you go up to the next income quartile, which is less than $65,000, only 16% will ever graduate. And when you ask why, I mean, what is the main driver? It's financial. But many instances, it's little amounts of money, relatively speaking. It's under $500. No one should have to drop out of college for less than $500, especially if you've been brought up in poverty, you've made it through high school, you've made it into college. So Barclays is committed to trying to help do that. So how are we going to do it? We're going to create a website that helps kids get mentally and financially prepared for college. And again, we are not experts in this. So we have talked to many people in this room. We have brought in kids from Delaware State that are employed with us right now. We have a cohort of teachers. We have students from high school that are working with us. We have a guy from Zynga who's working with us on how to engage kids. We are talking to anybody who can help us really make this work. But basically, the idea is sort of virtual mentoring. To your point, Cindy, it was, it's really you know kids talking to kids. So can I get kids that are being successful, getting through college, going back and talking to kids in high school? How did you do it? Where are the tricks? What made it work for you? How did you get financial aid? Really just helping to guide each other through the process. Um, so that's the, the first piece of it. It'll also have goal setting, but we're not going to be big content drivers. We will send people to other websites. There are fabulous websites out there, but most of it is adults pushing information on kids. So if we can get kids talking to kids about how the successful ones are doing it, we hope that we can really make a difference there. And then creating a savings product. Again, we you know, are trying to do this on a national level so we don't have all the resources that's going on in San Francisco, but again, really rewarding people for good saving behavior. So there'll be incentives when you save you know, six months in a, row, in, a, in a row. There'll be incentives if you don't take withdrawals. There'll be incentives if you hang in there for two years. Again, all sorts of financial incentives to get these people engaged in saving not huge amounts of money. We're talking about goals of like 250 to $400, that sort of thing. 
And we'll also offer a 529 on there. It won't be a Barclays product, we don't have one, but we are really hoping this works. We know that's the best vehicle to save, but quite frankly, lots of people in poverty are afraid of that. There's real reasons to be you know, nervous about it, but then there's also urban legends. So we also have to educate people. We want it to be out there, we want to offer it, but it wouldn't be our product. So um, we are going to start this in uh, September. Uh, we will be out there, we will pilot it in Delaware. The hope is to take it on national level. We are not going to overdevelop it. We are going to do this so that we can make a lot of changes to it, so we can react to how the kids react. Um, but the idea is to figure out how to do it in Delaware and then take it on a national level. We want to be part of the solution here, um, and we are going to do our best. If anybody in here, like I said, we know we're not the experts, so we will take ideas, constructive feedback from anybody here about you know, ways that you think we can make this a better product. Um, but at the end of the day, we don't want any child to have to drop out of college for $400. Hi, good afternoon. I just want to say thank you to Melanie and Opportunity Nation and CFED um, for putting this on today. This is such a great panel. Um, and to Rachel and Senator Coons for introducing the American Dream Accounts Act that we're very excited to be a part of. Um, I'm sorry that Senator Rubio couldn't be here today, but I wanted to share with you guys briefly why the Senator is very excited to be a part of this bill um, and these efforts. If the Senator were here, he would tell you his story about um, coming from a family of modest means and attending a public university and then later graduating from a private law school. And the Senator did this with the help of federal financial aid, including Pell Grants and various loans and accumulated over $100,000 of student loans um, at the end of his educational career. Um, so Senator Rubio knows firsthand how important it is to have not only access but support in attending college um, and whatever kind of post-secondary graduation that you would like to attend. Um, and the Senator really is supporting the American Dream Accounts Act as a part of his commitment to promoting social and economic upward mobility in this country. Um, one thing that the Senator and I have in common is we are both student athletes and um, although our college careers were, were brief, I think that one of the things that is exciting about the bill is the encouragement that the partnerships and the collaboration that the American Dream Accounts have um, with, on children. Uh, when you're an athlete, you have coaches and parents and teammates and a lot of collaboration and encouragement, uh, not to mention the financial assistance that your parents pay to whatever club or organization you um, attend. And so you have all this incentive to succeed. Um, and I think that that's a really important and exciting piece of the legislation um, to encourage kids from such a very early age. There are people who are invested in you. You may not even know these people. They could be complete strangers, but they're investing their time and their money um, in your success and that really anything is possible um, in terms of your college education. Um, so just to conclude, I think you know we're really excited about supporting the American Dream Accounts Act and working with other colleagues here in the Senate. And um, we thank you guys for your support and for coming. Um, and we're looking forward to watching the bill move forward here. So I want to open it up for questions in just a minute, but I had a couple of questions for the panel. Um, one thing that struck me watching that amazing video and listening to you all talk was the important role the private sector played. Um, how do you encourage greater private sector participation and funding so that you ensure that there's real impact with what these accounts do? Thank you. Anyone? It's a, it's a great question. Um, I think uh, we certainly see the need for, as you, as you note, funding, which I think has to be a blend of public and private. Um, uh, we also see the need for the infrastructure that has frankly not grown, the, need, the, the infrastructure needs have not kept pace with the interest of the field. So it's encouraging to hear about the you know, new account products and City has this great product that they've been sharing, but what we know is that we, we, we don't yet have a, a nationally available product that is, uh, as the Senator said, portable and, and uh, online and easy to use. Um, we need to make sure that, that regulatory policy actually encourages rather than discourages that. I think there's a lot that, for instance, the financial regulators could do to make sure that financial institutions know 
uh, what their parameters are in opening these kinds of accounts, making sure that they get the right kinds of credit for doing that, and also that, that, uh, that on the other side of the policy house that we remove uh, certainly the financial aid barriers that savings can create, but also the barriers for, for, on the, for lower income families who are receiving public benefits. We want to make sure that they uh, aren't punished for saving for college by then losing public benefits for which they might otherwise be eligible. So I think there's a lot that on the policy front we can do, certainly on the market side, as you had asked, but also in some other really critical areas. Senior Jocelyn? You tell the stories. You have Jamiras. You have the folks that um, Senator Coons talked about and broke his heart over and over again until he had to walk away because it was too painful. If you want to make investment relevant, it's all about human beings. And I think we have, if we talk about wanting to scale these programs, there is not one of you in this room that does not know of hundreds and hundreds of these amazing young people whose stories need to be told. Because in aggregate, they're the ones that are going to change the face of this discussion. Um, Emily, this question is, is really directed at you. You have a room full of passionate advocates here who are very supportive of what Senator Rubio and Senator Coons have done. What can we do as a group to ensure this bill becomes reality? Thanks. That's a great question. And um, <laughs> uh, There's a lot of things that you guys can do, but most importantly, uh, this is one of the greatest things that you guys are doing is just showing your support and showing up here and um, letting your representatives in Congress know that you're excited about this idea, uh, what this idea and opportunity would mean for children in your community, children and families in your community. Um, so I would encourage you to contact your legislators. Um, you know, those emails and those letters really do go somewhere, and those phone calls, they all get recorded, and um, they mean a lot to the senators. Their encouragement and they're showing what support we have back in our communities and back in our states. Um, and just to continue the conversations, I mean, it's really exciting to see the collaboration between so many different groups and financial sectors and Congress and Opportunity Nation and um, groups around the country. So please just continue your advocacy. This is the hard work. Um, you guys travel a lot and you guys have a lot of meetings, and, but it really does mean a lot at the end of the day. I could keep asking questions of you guys, but want to make sure I open it up to the audience. Um, we have a microphone, I believe, that, that's wandering around. Um, raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the panelists. Uh, I had a question for Jose Cisnero, so were there, can I ask that now? Okay. Um, Jose, join us. I was just curious if you could explain the, how the savings account will affect the FAFSA form and, uh, for those students where they will have to fill out parent contribution and because they are penalized now for having any income if they're... Sure, yeah. sure, sure. We're looking at that. Um, our, our, our account holders are in kindergarten, first and second grade now, so fortunately we have a little time <laughs> to figure out how quite that's going to work out or maybe even change some of the policies. One of the things we were actually more, um, I, so I, I don't know exactly the answer to how we're going to um, find that it's going to work. Right, right now, the way that we think it's going to work is because this, these accounts are set up in the name of the city and county of San Francisco, where ultimately our property, we see it as an educational gift at that time that they, they actually don't have to report as their own asset honestly when they're filling out that form or any other documentation about what the family's assets truly are. We find that that's even um, critical today because to the point that um, just got brought up, there are many families that have um, you know, benefit uh, limits and criteria. And again, um, our concern was that these savings were to in any way change that, that landscape for them. We might see some impacts that we didn't want to have. Again, because when the monies come into the account, they're actually coming into account ultimately owned by the city and county. These don't show up on the balance sheets of those families. Do you guys want to add anything? I would love to add something to that. So I want to just uh, applaud the city and county of San Francisco for being willing to serve as the custodian of these yeah. accounts for that reason. But I want to underscore what a huge undertaking that is. And in every community where we're trying to get kids' savings up and running, we have to go ask the same question. Who could serve that role? And the reason we have that role is not because we want a custodian. It's because we have policy artifacts 
that are making the custodian necessary so that lower income families aren't being punished for saving for their children's future. So I, I just want to underscore the need for, to address the kind of underlying cause of that custodial role. And I would also add that it's not, you know, for us, it's looking doing it at a national level. It really comes down to a state by state basis. So it's not, I mean, it is, it is so complicated. And we have spent months trying to figure out the FAFSA form and the effects to benefits. And, you know, if a bunch of bankers can't figure this out, I mean, I, I don't know who can. So we are um, right with you on trying to help make this a little bit easier. Any other questions? With microphones coming right behind you. Sorry. So, um, 10 years from now, 12 years from now, when these kids are getting ready to graduate from high school, what if they are not going to go to any kind of other educational program? Who it, will the trustee of will San Francisco get to have that money then, and will they distribute it as incentives, or how are they? you know, to other students? Excellent question. So uh, the way our program is going to work is we're bringing in all this money, and yes, it's, because it's going into the account of the city and county of San Francisco. The structure is actually uh, a custodial account with a whole se series, literally thousands, of sub-accounts connected to the custodial right. account. Um, each child's uh, savings go into those accounts and any of the incentive matches and, and, and other things similar to it that we create in the future. If the child uh, actually turns by the time the child turns 25 and is no longer a child um, and doesn't use the money or, or all of the money for an educational purpose, at that time the account will be closed and any of the family money, any of the money that the child put in, the family, any, any non-program money or city money will be given to the 25-year-old at that time. So they do ultimately get to keep all of their money. Any of the matches, the incentives, things like that, which we were really putting there to, to support the college the educational purpose, any of those would come back into the program and we use that to support some other child's college education or educational purpose. So we want to make sure we treat everyone fairly. Well, could it be transferred to a sibling? Again, at, at, the, t at the time that the person turns 25, it'll go back to that, the 25-year-old who could do whatever he or she wants with it. Is there a beneficiary on the count? So for example, if the person dies? Uh, right again, right now, it's in the name of the child, and it, it will, right. you know, that's where the sub account goes. Right. Um, again, we have a little time to figure out, but probably in the case of an actual um, passing of a child, that we it would be the family that would receive the family funds that were put into the account. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Lizzie, right there. Um, this is just a follow-up question for San Francisco. What unique identifiers do you have um, since they're seamlessly enrolled? And I know it's such a transient population. Mm -hmm. Students often have similar names and things. How mm -hmm. do you ensure without something like a social security number, which is really cumbersome to collect, that the money upon withdrawal will actually go to the correct student? Or what have you built in, I guess? You, you, you ask such an important question because as I talked about the regulatory hurdles of setting up this, this program, certainly the banking know your customer rules, right, are, are critical in doing anything of this type of thing. Fortunately, we, we landed with Citibank's partnership and a lot of legal help um, um, from, from very learned people. We landed on the custodial account purpose, but even still for the sub accounts, we needed to have enough information to show that we could identify who the account holder was. The, the saving, the, the, the real lifesaver for our program is the partnership of the school district. The school district, when it enrolls each student, has enough information to uniquely identify that student for all the right educational, federal benefit, re all those reasons. So what they are able to share with us, and I think it's not insignificant that they're sharing it with us as another local government uh, entity, they're able to share with us the child's name, the date of birth, the home address, and the name of parent or guardian. And it's those four pieces of information that they have that help allow us to uniquely identify that child and continue to hold this account in his or her name. Follow up right here. Um, how will the actual um, withdrawals, the determination that it is a qualified expense, how does that part work? Again, we have a few years to figure this out. 
fortunately. But our thinking right now is there's already criteria set up for the federal 529 program, which we understand is very broad, very comprehensive. It's almost any educational purpose, as you heard us quote, quote in the film, anything, supplies, housing, food, tuition, you name it, vocational school, um, anything a, 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 a student wants to tackle, we want to make sure that the funds are there for that purpose. So our plan is to pretty much mimic the 529 um, eligibility. We have gone past our time, so maybe one more question. Anyone? <laughs> There's one in the back, too. There's one, wait, Lizzie, behind you. All the way in the back. Thanks. I think this question would be to, like, directed to Lee, but I'm just, we, we've heard a little bit about Cuyahoga County and Colorado, Puget Sound, Nevada. I was just curious if there are any important differences between the model in San Francisco and these other experiments going on. That's a great question. San Francisco has, has definitely served as the inspiration, uh, as uh, the, their staff can tell you, based on all the phone calls that they get asking for information. Um, but I will say there, the, the approaches are different in every community. Um, as much as we might like for this to be a cookie cutter model that we could just sort of rubber stamp into each different place, the, the fact is that the players are different, the financial institutions are different, the resources are different in every community. So while there are some core elements, like you know, there's an account, there's typically a custodian, there's a program manager, there are savings incentives, those things are consistent across the board. Uh, the, the, the details really do need to be and have been customized for every community. Every place needs to do this in a way that fits uh, the kids and families that they'll be serving. Can I add one other thing there? An interesting model is sometimes you go with where your donor is. We have a small mountain county down near Asheville with an um, Appalachian alum who has been incredibly successful. And he looked at some of the great research that um, Ed Trust and others have done, um, the Lumina Foundation, that third and fourth grade math scores are incredibly indicative of future success. So this individual in this county offered a full ride to Appalachian to third and fourth graders in this particular school system with the highest end of grade math scores, and we now have eight of them. This happened a decade ago, and we have eight that have matriculated to Appalachian and our grads in things like actuarial sciences. Who figures that out when you're in the third or fourth grade? <laughs> so to Lee's point, sometimes you go where your donor is or you go where that private entity has a very vested interest in a particular area, and they help you define it. Um, and, and I think we shouldn't ever underestimate that serendipitous connection. As you can see, there's a lot of interest in this topic, and we probably could have sat here for many hours and, and continued to, to talk with each other. Thank you all so much for participating on the panel. Um, I want to have Mark Edwards come up here and close us out.